The Bible opens with God in his workshop having a great idea. Let's make people just like ourselves. When he finished, he looked over what he had done, and he said, yes! Well, maybe your Bible doesn't say it that way. Um, and if it doesn't, you might need a new version. How else would God say, that is very good? After that, something went terribly wrong. The first people were lied to. They decided they had a bad dad. They decided they were better off without him. So they began to take steps to distance themselves from him. There was much they did not understand about that decision. One thing is, thinking they had a bad dad meant they were children of a bad dad. And the shame that came on him in, that, in them in that moment made them want to hide. Genesis 3, 8 says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. There was a conversation that started when Adam first opened his eyes. Adam and Eve and Dad walking and talking in the beautiful garden. This conversation was part of what God referred to when he said, that is very good. As Adam and Eve hid in fear and shame, the conversation that started when Adam first opened his eyes was in danger of coming to an end. Thank God the conversation did not end. It became prayer. Prayer is the continuation of the conversation between God and all of us. In prayer, we get free of the shame that threatened the conversation. In prayer, we open our hearts to God, and he becomes comforter, counselor, teacher, and guide. I highly recommend prayer. I also recommend the chapter in Steps to Christ called The Privilege of Prayer. While I highly recommend prayer, I also share with you that prayer has been one of my most difficult experiences. And I know I'm not the only one that uh, has found prayer to at times be extremely difficult and confusing. This does not need to be a surprise. Even the Bible writers sometimes cried out to God in their pain. As an example, let me read from King David's prayer journal, Psalms 44, starting with verse 8. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. But, but, but you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe, and those who hate us have gotten spoil. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. All this has come upon us, though we have not been false to your covenant. We've not forgotten you. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Awake! Why are you sleeping? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why are you hiding your face? I'm glad David's conversation with God did not end there. In the New Testament, the stories continue of people who sometimes found relating to God to be painful and difficult. In John 11, two sisters, Mary and Martha, sent a message to Jesus letting him know their brother Lazarus was sick. John 11:4 4 says, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. A few days later, Lazarus died. What a strange painful experience it must have been for Mary and Martha to bury their brother after believing the promise. I'm glad Mary and Martha's conversation with God did not end there. If you had talked with them later, they would have excitedly told you the rest of the story. You may be familiar with the pain of unanswered prayer. If you are not, be aware that you are sitting near someone who is. In those moments of pain, there can be a tremendous pressure to find relief. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. To, to a heart sickened by hope deferred, it can seem like the hope is, that hope is the problem. It can seem like it would be a great relief to simply give up hope. If you are in that place of pain, please know that those we just read about, David and Mary and Martha, 
would encourage you to continue the conversation with God. They would assure you that it will be worth it. I believe that even when we need to say words like what we just read in Psalms 44, this can become a very good prayer experience. Now, some might say, Randy, that's hard to imagine. Just what do you think a very good prayer experience looks like anyway? Well, thanks for asking. Uh, let's go to Psalms 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. What would it mean to have deceit in your spirit? Uh, well, we would call that denial. David is describing being dishonest with God or hiding in fear like Adam and Eve. This often includes being dishonest with ourselves. You know, we can be so dishonest with ourselves that we don't even know what's going on in our own hearts. Sin can create a misery deep down inside. Even when denial is so complete, hey, you don't know what's wrong. Does this author speak from experience? Let's find out. Verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. I hear the pain of a guilty conscience. So what did he do about it? Verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Would David recommend this approach to prayer to others? Verse 6, Therefore let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Shall I accept this recommendation? Why? What would be the benefit? Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. Do you hear a renewed sense of peace? Do you hear a deep awareness that he's loved and protected? David speaks directly to God about his restored trust. Verse 7, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Now the best part of a good prayer experience. God answers. In whatever way God gets through to you, you become aware of his compassion for you and his commitment for your life to go well. Here's God answering. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. God says, you, you did this the hard way this time. You went on in your pain until your guilty conscience was yanking you around like, a, like the reins of a horse. Repentance does not have to be so painful if you keep your heart open I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye on you. God is gently inviting us to a choice here. Would you rather go bumbling on until the hurt down inside tells you something's wrong? Or would you rather come to God for instruction and counsel before you even get started? Receiving God's guidance is part of a very good prayer time. So let's look at this too. Sometimes we speak of God guiding us with open doors or closed doors. In, in this metaphor about horses, we might talk about uh, being guided with open gates or closed gates. But let me ask you something. If you think a closed door is God saying no, then how will you know when a closed door is a challenge your faith should smash? If you think an open door is God saying yes, then how will you know when an open door is a distraction that you need to stay away from? I believe God's answer to these questions would be, do not be like the horse or mule which have no understanding. So they must be controlled by open gates and closed gates. God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. There may be times to consider open doors and closed doors, but I believe God is inviting us into a much more personal prayer experience. His instruction, teaching, and counsel would be given as he gently looks you in the eye. This prayer time ends like every good prayer time with a celebration of God's goodness coming out of a heart full of gratitude and peace. Verse 10, many are the woes of the wicked, 
but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. That is what I call a good prayer time. Every major spiritual breakthrough I have experienced has followed this pattern. I found myself in pain that I didn't understand. I chose to keep my heart open to God. God took the lead. He showed me what was going on inside and led me to repentance and then back to peace and gratitude. Sometimes this took minutes and sometimes it took years. Sometimes uh, I had to get some help from people who have more experience with prayer than I do. Even the book of Job follows this pattern. Job had to come to a deeper honesty and repentance than he ever imagined could be needed. God led him to honesty. God met him in that honesty and restored him to peace and gratitude. God is faithful. So if your prayers sound like Psalms 44, you are in good company with David, Mary and Martha, and Job. While speaking honestly, keep your heart open to the change in perspective that comes from his heart. We've talked about prayer bringing honesty, forgiveness, peace, refreshment, and a renewed sense of direction. As good as that is, it's only a beginning. Prayer is the continuation of the conversation between God and people that started in, in Eden. A conversation that God called very good. At creation, God made mankind the stewards or managers of the earth. Through salvation, God restored that stewardship when it was lost. God intends that through prayer, we come to him for everything we need to enter into that restored stewardship. Jesus said, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I hope you've already experienced all the answers to prayer we've talked about. At the same time, I suspect that you, like me, have discovered some stuck places where the promises don't seem to be working like expected. There are reasons why most every discussion you hear about prayer has a section in it about unanswered prayer. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. There are times when we find ourselves calling out, I did ask. When does this work? How does this work? What's wrong? The Bible addresses this topic in a number of ways. Today we have time to consider just one of them. 1 Corinthians 11.30, that is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. This passage tells us there are reasons why some of the people we have prayed for earnestly are still sick and some have died. What is that? Let's have a look. The words we are talking about are part of a discussion about the communion service in 1 Corinthians. So let's start by going to the first time in this letter the communion service is mentioned. Uh, chapter 10, verse 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we share the one loaf. When, when we receive the, the bread that represents Christ's body, we become one with him spiritually. When many of us become one with him spiritually, we are also becoming one with each other. There's more to the communion service discussion continuing in 11.17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine coming to the end of a communion service and hearing Jesus say, I wish you wouldn't have done that? Those would be difficult words to hear. So what's he talking about? Verse 18. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. Remember, because there is one loaf... We who are many are one body, for we share the one loaf. It's God's purpose for the Lord's Supper to powerfully bring us into unity. I believe this unity is most evident in the appreciation for Jesus that we share. The passage begins to show how we treat others can become the biggest hindrance to answered prayer. 
The tragedy is not that we disagree. The tragedy is the, that we allow our disagreements to get in the way of our hearts. The tragedy is that we allow our differences to stop our fellowship. The passage then gets specific about what was causing division in this case, verse 20. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, for when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. See, the, the choice to take communion is a choice to receive the forgiveness, healing, and life that comes to us through the new covenant. Jesus also entered into the new covenant by taking communion with his disciples. As he did this, he stepped into his role in the covenant. The result was the sins of the world came on him with such force, it was soon crushing out his life. The communion service is not just a ceremony. It's a point of entry into the power and blessing of the new covenant. Verse 27, so then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. By taking communion, we accept the death of Jesus for ourselves, along with the unity it brings. If we accept unity while thinking and acting in ways against that unity, we create a war within ourselves and we create a war among ourselves. In the gospel story, Judas took communion in an unworthy manner. He did it with judgment and rejection in his heart toward Jesus and his disciples. Here's how the Bible describes that moment. Jesus had announced that some would betray him. The disciples asked, John 13, 25, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas. Verse 27, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Judas did not understand the power of what he was doing. He was entering into covenant of oneness with the body and attacking the body at the same time. At that moment, Satan entered into him. Within hours, he was dead. I have committed the sin described here. When I was about six or seven, a Catholic family moved in near us. Uh, one day, I was out playing with, uh, with one of their boys, and uh, we got to uh, comparing notes about the uh, Christian schools that we were attending. He said, uh, we're learning how to pray. And as an illustration, he knelt down right out there in the field and uh, turned his face toward heaven and recited the Lord's Prayer. It was a beautiful moment, but I didn't see the beauty in it. I pulled together all my Protestant arrogance and I said, we don't pray memorized prayers. Years later, I was at a training that was also attended by a Catholic woman, and I, I told her this story. And she responded uh, by uh, making some remarks about how we often don't understand each other. And I said, well, I just needed to tell that to a Catholic. And then she understood where I was headed and responded like a good Catholic. She said, well, you're forgiven. <laughs> that was a beautiful moment. Sometimes we don't even know that we have been tearing at the fabric of unity that Jesus himself is weaving. So the passage goes on to instruct us, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. What is discerning the body of Christ? Now, last week, Tony, thanks for giving me a chance to share this story. Tony was sharing with us that uh, as he was out and about, he found himself talking with the, the pastor of, a, of another church in town. The pastor asked Tony what church he attended. And when Tony shared, 
the pastor winced and responded with mentioning his concerns about Adventists having uh, trouble with legalism. Now, perhaps the golden rule would help here. How would you like to be treated by someone who disagrees with you? Try this. Tony, it's wonderful that you found Jesus. Uh, I find myself uh, even wanting to uh, accept him all over again because I know that the angels in heaven celebrate every time somebody accepts him. That's wonderful. And it's also wonderful that you have found a place of fellowship. Do we ever treat other Christians the way that pastor treated Tony? Have you ever said, too bad, they don't have the truth? Let's begin our thoughts about other Christians with the same celebration that happened in heaven when they got saved. Let's start by making sure they are aware of the unique and specific graces that are hanging over their lives waiting to be received. Discerning the body of Christ at the very least means welcoming into fellowship all those who have received the body and blood of Jesus. In the first Corinthians passage we are discussing, rich people saw poor people as having no significance. They thought the pain of the poor was so insignificant that it was okay to eat their bountiful lunch in front of the poor who were going hungry. That would be not discerning the body of Christ. That would be failing to recognize the value of people that Jesus is investing in. That would be saying people do not have value when Jesus is saying, I died for them. The consequences of these judgments are horrendous. When we attack the body of Christ in this way, it is a powerful attack. These attacks can weaken the body so much that we become unable to receive answers to our prayers for healing. Verse 30 says, that is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. Another story, when I was a teenager trying to get through college, I had loaded hay trucks and hauled hay. And uh, one time a long lost cousin came to visit and decided he was gonna help us for the morning. So uh, we went out uh, and uh, loaded trucks all morning in the 120 degree heat of Eastern Washington. And at noon, we sat down in a tiny shred of shade to eat our lunches. And when I opened my lunch, I found a thermos of boiling hot soup. And I complained. Well, uh, my cousin responded with a story. He said when he was a child, he and his family were very poor. They often went hungry. One day, his mom and dad were uh, in town looking for jobs or whatever they could find as a way to bring home some food. And he and his siblings, um, waiting at home, decided that they were going to pray until Jesus gave them something to eat. Sometime later, they heard a knock at the door. When they answered the door, they found that boxes of groceries on the porch and a couple of nuns just exiting the, garden, the yard gate. That story still moves me. Ever since I heard it, if I start to complain about the food, I choke on my words. Thank God for people, for so many who love God and people and are willing to listen to God and God's promptings and respond. Thank God for them. While I am confessing the sin of disunity, let me add this. I remember driving by a particular church and whenever I went by there thinking, those people are foolish about the way they relate to the Holy Spirit. Well, it turns out that during some of my lowest times, those people with their understanding of the Holy Spirit were the ones that helped me out. They helped me see that um, there were lots of people that I needed to forgive in order to get better. And it helped. Thank God for them. See. I was the one who was foolish, and my foolishness was hindering the answers to my prayers. Please hear me. I understand that in Adventist thinking about the future, a powerful figure 
will try to hijack Christian unity in a giant power grab. Unity may become the watchword of the Antichrist. Adventists may be the only whistleblowers. In that season, others will need the understanding we bring. Here is what we need to understand. This possible future is all the more reason to become people who truly discern the body of Christ. If that day finds us tragically immature about unity, we will be of no use to anyone. All of Christianity needs us to grow up into love. So what should we do when people are simply wrong in their thinking or choices? Our first task is to invite them deeper into the reality of communing with God through prayer and the Lord's Supper. Jesus gave communion to Judas. Judas did not understand what he was doing. Jesus did understand what he was doing. Jesus, by choice, entered into covenant to take Judas' sins to the cross. Doesn't that give you confidence that no matter how far we have strayed, Jesus is inviting us back into communion and fellowship? Doesn't that make you want to invite everyone into communion? There are people doing very destructive things in the name of Jesus. The thing to remember is they are demonstrating that they desperately need Jesus. They need the body of Christ to transform them at a deep, deep level. May our responses draw them into the depth of communion with Christ that will transform. Second, help them get to know the beauty of their calling into the family of God. Show them a big God and a big destiny that everything that God is calling us into, so much that everything else loses its attraction. Please also consider that we can carry disunity on the inside. We can reject ourselves in ways that are just as destructive as rejecting others. So in, the, in any way we have done this, it is essential to let go of those judgments and forgive ourselves. Remember, Adam and Eve's first response to sin was to hide from each other and from God. David helped us understand that hiding does not work. Overcoming sin means, first of all, to go against that urge to hide and choose to remain in God's presence. When we welcome into God's presence at the foot of the cross all who are choosing to receive communion, including ourselves, we are choosing unity. That unity is essential to answered prayer. I desire very much for us to be a church that builds unity among ourselves and invites the rest of Christ's followers into unity. Because this matter is so important, there are instructions here for us to follow. Verse 28. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats of the, and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. In this context, examining yourself means consider how we've been treating other people. It means repentance for the ways that we have torn the fabric of unity that Christ is weaving. As I continue, I will suggest a, a prayer that fits these instructions. The prayer starts with each of us forgiving ourselves first, and there are reasons for that I hope to talk about at another time. Please feel free to use these words I suggest or ask the Spirit of God to give you the right words to pray as needed. Father, help us to pray. As I pause for a moment, I ask for the Spirit of God to activate our consciences and show us what we need to see in order to come into unity. So please pray this prayer with me. Father, I repent for ways I have treated myself with disrespect. I ask you to cleanse me by the blood of Jesus. Please restore unity inside my heart. Father, I repent for the ways I have damaged unity. I repent for ways I have looked down on or hurt others who receive the bread and wine. 
I repent for responding to hurt by withdrawing from others. I receive the blood of Jesus that cleanses me of these sins. Father, I forgive all who have hurt me and those I love by choosing disrespect or disunity. I forgive all who have created a culture that makes disunity seem normal or okay. I plead for the blood of Jesus to cleanse us and our fellowship from every sin and every defilement. Thank you for this cleansing. Father, I pray for complete restoration of all healing the enemy has stolen through disunity. By Jesus' wounds, we have been healed, body, soul, and spirit, mind, will, emotions, and fellowship. Thank you, Father, for your gracious gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for praying with me. You are invited to have your very own, very good conversation with God. The pattern in Psalms 32 is very clear. The way into excellent prayer is through deep honesty. Even if your prayers have become painful and frustrating as Psalms 44, keep coming back to God with an open heart until you receive peace and new perspective. If you want to talk with someone about how it's going in prayer, I would be honored if you pick me. I'm still a beginner at being a respectful listener. I'll do my best to bless you. Prayer meeting is Wednesday at 6 p.m. That's a good setting to pray and to talk with others about how prayer is going. Go with God.